Good morning, guys. Can you see me and hear me? Hello. Ling Kai Ching, were you there? Yes, sir. Can you see me and hear yes, me clearly? Sir. Yes. Thank you. Okay, let's start. Uh, today, I will start with the first topic, project inceptions. As uh, what I have uh, showed you yesterday, there are altogether five topics. The first topic is a project inceptions. Uh, uh, for development process, uh, that means uh, from the start, uh, when the client approach the designer of uh, intention to have a development project until the project completed, we need to go through few processes or few milestones. Although there are many participants involved in the project development, such as architect, quantity surveyor, engineer, uh, and other uh, professionals, but uh, none of the professional institutions have come up with the standard plan of work. That means what they're supposed to do or how to break down the work to the various uh, milestones so that it is a uh, easy control. Now, just now I said none other than the uh, lawyer institutes of British architect. So that's why we call this RIPA plan of work. So in fact, uh, RIPA RIBA is a lawyer institution of, of British architect. So by looking at the name, we know it is a uh, institution in UK. So uh, uh, in generally, most of the country or most of the people practice are adopt, adopting RIBA's brand of work for to explain or to manage the process of the work. Although RIPF, for example, is not controlling our Lembaga architect or Persatuan architect, so they, they, they don't have any uh, uh, controlling authority or, or, or those kind of uh, linkage. The only similar thing is because it is the same professions, that's all. But nevertheless, most of the time we are adopting RIPA plan of work as a standard process for the development. Uh, you take note again, uh, this is RIPA plan of work 2020, which means this is the latest version of RIPA plan of work. Uh, before that, there are many, many versions. In other words, RIPA are keep improving the process. And uh, what I show, you, show to you over here is the latest uh, plan of work. I will go to, uh, I will discuss a more detail in later uh, lecture uh, for each of the processes. So far, can you understand the, you know, uh, what is RIPA plan of work? and the relationship with uh, what we are going to discuss. I hope you get the ideas. Now for the RIPA plan of work process, uh, uh, you can see over here, 
RIBA, that is a UK. U, UK are using, uh, definitely UK is uh, referring to RIBA plan of work. So uh, over here, you can see uh, there's a main category or the process of the development process. It start with a pre-design, design, construction, handover in use, end of life. Then when we look at the IBA, so for example, for this column, if you can see carefully, uh, for this column, IBA are not using. So like uh, other European country, they are using this process is called preliminary design. So if you are following IBA, there's a no preliminary design. In other words, uh, then for USA, they are not using they are not having a prelim preliminary design. Then uh, for the New Zealand, for example, New Zealand, they, they use a preliminary design as well. For Australia, they call it schematic design. And then uh, South Africa, they call it design development. So that is a difference. Huh? You can see the process of the UK and other country. Uh, this is a give you a clearer view. All right, so uh, now what I try to show you on this uh, slide is different country are uh, adopting the different process, but as a whole, we can conclude that it involves pre-design, design, construction, handover in use and end of life. End of life, for example, uh, European country, they are start using end of life. So for European country, they are more concerned with the sustainability issues. So they have an end of life, but uh, not in all mm -hmm. other country, uh, including UK, USA, they are not uh, using end of life. They don't have the stage of end of life. So generally, most of the country are covered until here from the pre-design, design, construction, handover, and in use. Okay, so far, any questions? Any comments from you all? Now, uh, you can see here, this is a IPA plan of work, the first columns, uh, uh, preparation, design, pre-construction, construction, use, uh, this is a more detail. Initially, uh, IPA plan of work. So uh, this is uh, what they have a uh, cover. All right, initial initially. Then come to the QS. For the QS, uh, what we have is the what we call the new rules of measurement. That is uh, published by Lawyer Institute Institution Chapter Surveyor. Again, this is the UK body is not a local body. Now, uh, the reason is our local body, we don't we don't have a such a standard procedures. All right. So that's why what I adopted here, we are referring to the Lawyer Institute Charter Surveyor. So that is uh, again a uh, UK, UK process. So uh, for the QS involvement during the preparation stage, we need, we need to prepare order of cost estimate. So that is exactly what I expect you to do in the synopsis. All right, I will come to that later. And then during the design stage as a QS, so you're supposed to do the cost plan. You know, your cost plan, it could be many, many cost plan. All right, not necessarily limit to plan three. Then uh, once the BQ production information, uh, that is uh, more or less your BQ already. You can start to have a pre tender estimate. So now we are not looking at the cost plan already. We are looking at the, your actual quantity and estimate the cost. Now, uh, during the tender process, of course, you have a bill of quantities. So once, once the tender is over, the QS need to come up with the fresh estimate. The reason is, as a QS, your estimate and what the contractor, what the contractor submitting the tender, 
it is impossible to be exactly the same. So it could have a variance for 10, 20 percent, etc. So therefore, after the tender, as a QS, you have to uh, finalize and uh, what we call the post tender estimate again. So normally, this is uh, QS involved in the process. Now, just now I'm talking about IPA plan of work. Huh? The, 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 the column above uh, for this uh, column above, that is the initially. Now for the recent year, for example, in 2013, due to the, you know, uh, 2000, 2013, uh, as you know, we start uh, using the beam building information modeling, which are getting uh, more popular. So IPA come up with a new version of a plan of work. Now uh, you can compare with these columns. Uh, you can compare this column with this column. Then uh, you can see the terms. Uh, there's a quite uh, substantial changes in the terms. So like for example, previously technical design productions, information, tender documentation, tender actions. Previously, uh, IPA plan of work have a more detailed uh, breakdown, but over here it just uh, group it under one process called it known as technical design. Then during the construction stage, uh, previously with a mobilization and construction and completion. So in the IPA 2013, it it was merged together and known as a construction. And for the users uh, stage uh, post practical completions are uh, known as handover and close out. OK, so that is uh, what is uh, covered in the IPA plan of work 2013. Alright. Now uh, the latest one. The latest one uh, is RIPA plan 2020. Okay, 2020. Now, uh, U3E. U3E, are you around? Yes. Uh, 3 e now can you link us, uh, tell us what is the difference between RIPA plan of work 2020 and 2013? What are the differences? What can you find? The out? develop, the develop design change to spatial coordination. Okay, good. And the uh, construction change to manufacturing and construction. Okay. The handover and close out. Um, the handover and close out separate into handover and use. Okay, so they have uh, in use. Okay, now. Hmm. My key question here, uh, uh, you know, uh, that is the most important message here. Uh, can you speculate or do you know? If you don't know, you just uh, speculate, guess, never mind. Why the constructions are, uh, uh, you know, the stage are renamed as uh, manufacturing and constructions. What do you think, Chui? Uh, sorry, sir. Just now I didn't get okay. to your question. For the construction stage, uh, 2013 is known as two uh, constructions, but for the 2020, it was renamed as a manufacturing and constructions. Do you know the reason why? I don't know. Can you guess? What is the difference? Uh, you know the difference as a manufacturing at the age. Mm. Just make a wild guess, never mind. Because we start to have a manufacturing of the building system. Such as? The precast concrete. Very good. Okay, bingo. So for the for the construction stage, uh, because nowadays we are adopting uh, many of the components 
are pre-manufactured in the factory environment. Then only it bring to the site for the installations. You got it, Tree? Okay, thank you, sir. Yeah, so that exactly that that is the you know why manufacturing are at the end. For example, a typical example is uh, I was in the industry before I joined Utah in 2004. All right, before that, 1980 and 1990, I was in the industry. And during my times in the industry, all the roof trusses, you know about roof trusses? So all the roof trusses, we are constructed at the site. That means the laborer or the worker, they are joining pieces by pieces of the timber to meet the roof truss at the roof level height. Okay. But nowadays, all the roof trusses is uh, prefabricated in the factory. So once it's done already, it's just a uh, sand to the side and hoist up by the crane to install at the place. So that is uh, one of the greatest uh, difference I have uh, seen uh, from the time from industry. Then uh, later I joined academy and start become a lecturer. So that is the, the, the biggest uh, changes I have seen. And for the last couple of years, we have uh, promote more IBS, industrial building system, etc. And even now we have a 3D printing used in the constructions. So therefore we can see that the manufacturing are become uh, one of the great uh, changes in the construction industry. So therefore, the manufacturing are recognized by the IBA plan of uh, by the IBA. So therefore, they change the constructions and uh, add the manufacturing into the construction process. It to 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 shows that the importance of the manufacturing. Uh, in the constructions. Okay, can you understand this? Now I would like to call another student for my next question, sir. Gerard, were you there? Gerard, Gerard Lin? Gerard? Gerard? Hello, sir. Hello. Yeah, very soft. I hope you can speak louder. Okay, okay. Let me see. Yeah. Okay, I open my speaker to maximum. Gerard, yes. you are study quantity surveying profession, correct or not? Yes. Okay, now. What can you foresee the changes to your profession if the construction uh, is, uh, you know, uh, for construction uh, for normal construction now, nowadays are added in with more manufacturing? That means the manufacturing component are become a more and more significant part of the constructions. What will be the implication to your QS? as a QS professions. You got what I mean or not? Gerard? Yes. Mm. Can you answer that? Less time used for measurements. Sorry? Um, you spend less time on measurements. Spend less time on measurement. Probably yes, but as a QS, uh, you still need to prepare the costing as a whole because the client appoint you as a contractor, uh, as a quantity surveyor. You have to give a total, you know, total cost implication to the client. So therefore, uh, you still have to present the whole cost. And uh, 
it might you might have a less time preparing, but the the more important thing is as a QS, we have to know what we are doing. What are the changes of our professional services? Can you answer that? Jarak? Um. Not too sure. Never mind. About Never mind. Okay. Now, since you cannot answer that, can you let recommend a student to answer these questions? Your friend. Um, Lim Jingjie. Ling. Lim Jingjie. Lim Jingjie. Lim Jingjie. Okay. Were you there? You are wanted. Lim Jingjie. Come on, quickly, Lin Jin Jie. Lin Jin Jie, what is that? So Lin Jin Jie not around, ah. Lin Jin Jie. Yeah. I will try to call one more student. I try one more. Ang Inni. Ang Inni, were you there? Ang Inni. No response. So we have a second student. No response here. Lin Jin Jie, Ang Yin Ni. Okay, then uh, let me try another student. Okay, I'll, I'll try the last student. Uh, Chan Chi Hong, were you there? Chan Chi Hong. Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, can you can you uh, try to answer this uh, question? Yes, sir. What can you, you can you repeat uh, your questions? Okay. For the you know for construction stage ah. Uh, now, since we have uh, more and more manufacturing, the construction process, uh, we have uh, more and more manufacture components uh, used in the construction industry. Or the components are uh, uh, um, pre-manufactured in the factory environment before they bring into the con to the site. So what is the implication to your profession? As a quantity surveyor. That's implication. I, I think maybe uh, just is less relied in the site. Okay. Now let me let you uh, let me let you in this uh, question, sir. Uh, first of all, as a quantity surveyor, what is your principal services to the client? Cost management. Your principal services give to the client. Cost what is that? Cost management. Oh, cost management. Okay. What is the main tools you use for the cost management? The main tools you are using. I mean, for most of the QS or for any other profession, if they look at the QS, oh, I know QS is blah, blah, blah. So, what is that? Most uh, representative representations to the QS 
what is the document called? I give you the clue already. The document. What kind of document? Represent a uh, QS. PQ. Exactly. Okay. So QS, our main services is provide cost management. Okay, or cost advice to the client. And the main tools we are using is the PQ. All right. Now, now the question is, can you answer already? Now, the previously we are using the, I mean, mainly involved in construction. Now you have a manufacturing as a key component as well as other construction. So will the PQ same or not? It will definitely change. It will definitely change. Can you give example? Or can you specify uh, what are the area? Area. I think maybe the concrete and the formwork. Very good. Elaborate. Very good. So you are start thinking around the line. So we don't have to use formwork anymore and all, all combined together. Yes. Uh, yeah, you, are, you, you were almost there. Thank you. Okay. Okay, Thanks. thank you, Ji Hong. Now, uh, guys, what we can see here, I give you example. Traditionally, let's say when we are talking about floor slab, so what you need to measure, we, we are measuring the formwork, we measuring the reinforcement, then we measuring the cast in situ concrete. What is the volume, all these things. That is a traditional what we are doing. But with a more and more manufacturing components, so your presentation of a BQ will be different from the earlier part already, which means you don't need to measure formwork uh, separately, reinforcement separately, concrete separately, if you are using the precast slab. So what you need to describe is your precast slab. How many number or how many square feet or you know how many number in terms of a one panel, what are the sizes? So the measurement is a difference. It's a different from your traditional role already. So that's why you need to get yourself ready. Huh? with this kind of a uh, new way of uh, working. Probably it is not stated even in the SMM yet, but you have to foresee this are going to happen and how you are going to present your view of quantity of, or your measurement in a more up-to-date, uh, uh, more according to the art of the state of the technology. So these are the changes if you give to us. So uh, so that's why I, I highlight this part. Huh? So for the manufacturing, because there's a more manufacturing uh, component involved, the way of the how the QS used to pre present the bill of quantity or the costing, it will be different. All right, now now come to the last row. Huh? For UEPQ4883, that is our subject. So our subject, as you can see, the last row, I try to put, you know, all the process to group it within the five uh, main topics of our lecture. Now we are in the intersection. Now in terms of the QS, uh, in terms of the QS work, so in the intersections, we need to look into the order of cost estimate of course, uh, before, uh, there are two order of cost estimate. The first one, I call it rough order cost, order of cost estimate. Then we have a more accurate order of cost estimate. Then we have a initial cost plan, update cost plan. Then uh, during this process, uh, standard uh, technical design stage, we, we will have a bill of quantity, pre tender estimate, post tender estimate. Then uh, during the construction stage, of course, you need to prepare the progress uh, payment 
or we call it interim uh, variation, variation order. And also you need to prepare the cost report to the client. Then uh, for the final stage, we have a final account and whole life cost assessment. So though these are involved with our profession as a quantity surveyor. Any questions so far? Can someone respond me? No questions. Thank you. So now let's look into a bit detail uh, on the I RIPA plan of work. All right. Now I will still refer to the IPA plan of work uh, as far as uh, this uh, lecture concern or uh, for our discourse concern. I will still refer to that and uh, because that is only document we have a standard document when we're talking about the process. So uh, now this is the detail. Let's go to a bit detail. Uh, uh, for the first stage, we have a strategy definition. So for the strategy definition stage, uh, you can see here uh, as a QS, uh, probably what we need to produce or what we need to prepare is the business case. Okay, develop a business case for feasible option. So what is a business case? Later on, I will show you an example how to work up the business case. But generally, the ideas of business case is uh, very simple. Uh, this term are getting more and more popular, uh, uh, not only in construction industry, in the business world or in the project world. The business case is for you to develop the world to carry out the project. The world, that means, uh, you know, you, the, your project's uh, benefit, your project's uh, world, jia zi. So uh, what is the world of your project? So normally it determined by what is the income you can get from the project and then what are the expenses. When your income are more than expenses, so then you have a surplus. We call the surplus is a profit. So if that is a reasonable profit, so which means this project were to go ahead. So this is called a, uh, generally this is known as a business case. All right. Then uh, the second stage preparation and briefing. So during this stage, uh, uh, for the QS, probably you will be involved in the, you need to complete the feasibility study. Feasibility study, part of a feasibility study is your development, your development appraiser, or we call it the project budget. So just now during the early stage, the business case, you have a very rough, and why I call it as a rough order of estimate, which means it's very rough uh, how much uh, value I can generate from the project and how much is my estimate cost of the project that are based on very rough ideas. And uh, when you move to the more detail of the design have completed, so you need to go to more detail of the budget. OK, you can budget more detail. So uh, because uh, before that, probably you don't know what is your design, you just know that how many, what kind of building I want to build, how many units I want to build. But as your design are getting more detailed, so you know that, oh, the building, what are the actual size? And then what are the other infrastructure I need to include in the development? So therefore, you can have a more detailed information. So when you reach this stage, the project budget, it need to be agreed by the client. Okay, the client agree with you, yes, this is the amount. And let's say uh, your total construction cost, you estimate of uh, 300 million. Now this is known as the 300 million, the agreed the agree project budget, 300 million. Also is known as the cost limit, cost limit. Huh? It also known as the cost limit. That means you cannot exceed this amount. 
maximum you can spend is uh, 300 million. So that is called the cost estimate. Then when you come to concept conceptual design, your project brief will become a more detailed. And uh, you start using things like cost plan, uh, the cost plan to monitoring the or controlling the budget, uh, the, the project work. And uh, when you come to spatial considerations, so more or less your your design, okay, of the of the building are more firm. So in this case, uh, probably you will you are moving to LOT 300. You remember yesterday I explained LOT. So for your for your for your project, I expect you to prepare LOT 200 drawing only. But actually, uh, when you come to finalize this stage, more or less, you already go to LOD 300 already. So because your architecture concept and all the space provided for the different part of the building are more confirmed. Uh, and uh, during this stage, you need to update your cost plan. And when you come to the technical design, that is uh, it's a firm up already. So things like the detail, like reinforcement, number of power, uh, all the necessary construction detail. So this is the process. This is the stage you need to finish, finalize all this detail. So once you have uh, all this detail, that is the time you can get ready with your BQ. So once you have a BQ already, sir, you don't need to refer to the cost plan for the costing already. So from now onwards, you can base on the BQ to monitor your construction cost. OK, then during manufacturing and constructions, of course, you are using the BQ to value the work done by the contractor. Also, to use your BQ as a tool for value the variations uh, orders. And once you reach the handover stage, that is the time as a QS, you have to finalize your account. And for the project concerns, uh, the contractor have to, to start to prepare the as built drawing. Uh, we call it as, as built drawing uh, to hand over to the client so that uh, they can close the project. Then if we are looking in the use, that means uh, at this time, the owner already occupied uh, to use the building already. So at this stage, uh, if uh, you still are uh, being uh, called for to provide your professional service, so that is the time you can look into for the life cycle costing, things like, you know, the, the cost in use. I mean, uh, once you start operating the building already, what you estimate the performance of the building, things like energy consumptions, okay? So what are the energy consumptions planned and actually in use? Are they the same? So if not, they are not the same, they are different. What caused the differences? So that you can incorporate this new knowledge uh, earn to be used in your future project. So this is the RIPA plan of work. And uh, just now I also briefly tell you, you know, what is your role as a QS involved in the whole process. Any question so far? Any questions? Uh, no, sir. Thank you. Now, if no questions, uh, I would like to move to the new uh, sections. Uh. Now, for this part, uh, for this part, what what I would like to tell you is, for the whole pre-construction process, okay? That means uh, before you you actually carry out the construction process, or the whole construction process is a uh, can be break down further into the three uh, processes. One process is the design process. Then the other process is known as a statutory process. Okay, 
the third one is called the costing process. So for the design process, uh, uh, mainly I involved with the designer. Think like you start with a conceptual design, your schematic design, okay? Schematic design, this is uh, what we call the LOT 200, more or less, okay? That is your, your, your drawing and stop here. Then uh, technical design, that is you need to provide a more detail like the reinforcement, all those are detail and as built drawing. So in terms of a drawing, uh, you can see these are the process are involved. And uh, in terms of uh, costing uh, financial aspect, so you can see as a QS, you need to go through with uh, first is a business case, then you have your project budget, then you use the cost plan. Then uh, after that, you will have a BQ, etc. You will have your pre tender estimate, post tender estimate, interlink valuation, final account, etc. Now, other than these two components uh, done by so called uh, the consultant or professional team, uh, these are the work by the professional team. There's another very important component that is a statutory process. So statutory process, that is the process in, involved with the local authority or, or we call it government. Uh, that is a governing body, local authority. So uh, the government, uh, any construction work you want to carry out at any site, you need to apply for the development order and get the planning permissions. And uh, subsequently, once the building is done already, the building is done already, you need to send to the local authority for the building plan approval. Then only you can start to carry out the constructions. Otherwise, it is illegal if you carry out any construction without getting the approval for the relevant statutory body. Okay. I prefer to call statutory body. Uh, statutory, statutory body means uh, 法定的组织, 法定组织. That means those organization or authority, they are set up under the law. Because uh, in general, as a layman, we like to say government, government approval. But the concept of the government is very abstract. What does it mean by government? All right. So uh, now for this, uh, for, for the different different level of government, I will explain in the in next week's uh, lecture. So anyway, in generally, I will I would like to call this process as a statutory process. Statutory process, uh, as I say, statutory, the ch Chinese translation uh, is fa ding, fa li de fa, jue ding de ding, fa ding, which means uh, these are the law or these are the rules set up according to the law. So we, uh, for any activity, we have to comply to the law. Why we need to comply to the law? That is how we can live in a society peacefully. So why I like to use a statutory uh, law or statutory process? Because even the government, they have to follow the law. If we say uh, we need to get the government approval only, and then the government are uh, not following the law. so. If he, he is happy, he approved your project. If he is not happy, he don't approve your project. If we are live under such a society, so do you think this is a society you wish you you have? So it could be something like you know some of the least developed country whereby the corruption are or things like that are more popular. So which means the people are not. Uh, you know, they, they carry out the, the, their duty and not according to the law. So therefore, the government have to follow the law as well. So that's why I would like to call this as a st statutory process rather than 
complying government uh, instructions. Can you understand what I mean or not? So as a university graduate uh, or as a professional, I wish uh, you can have uh, this kind of a uh, mentality. Uh, okay, I think I continue. Lah. Okay, so the next stage uh, now uh, you see uh, over here, I will talk about the design process, the, the design process, the statutory process, and the costing process in more detail in the next uh, few slides uh, before we go for the break. Now, take for example, take for example, what is this uh, project? Anyone can tell me? Anyone want to help me? Yeah. What is this project? Yes? Uh, yeah, very good, Charles. Charles. Okay, so uh, this is a KLCC. Now, uh, actually the KLCC, uh, before it go to the design, all right, before the actual design. So uh, the original, this is the sketch made by Caesar Perry. Caesar Perry is the architect from Argentina. So he is the architect of the KLCC. So at first, that is his uh, concept, you know, how the building will look like. So it start just with the scratch, something like that. Then of course, uh, once this uh, drop, this uh, this uh, sketches uh, agree or accepted by the client, then they will start to look into more detail the concept, uh, how to make the building stand up. So that's why you can see, you know, so uh, how how they plan, you know, uh, how to make the two building tied together, all right, and then. Uh, the column they have, etc., and also consider about how to put the uh, the bridge uh, joining the two building together. How it was uh, supported in the two building, etc. So this is their uh, conceptual design. Okay, conceptual design. And in terms of the floor plan, uh, can you see the twin tower behind here? So if you look from the top, uh, so it is uh, something like a uh, eight pointer, one, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight pointer uh, shape. Okay, this eight pointer square uh, shape actually is two interlocking squares. Uh, there are two two square interlocking, change their shape. Then it becomes something like that, eight pointer shape. And this uh, eight pointer, eight pointer shape, uh, pointer star shape, actually is a uh, Islam, Islam uh, geometry, which uh, represent the Islamic principle of unity, harmony, stability, and rationality. So initially, that was the plan. Initially, uh, you see the earlier start, they think of uh, two buildings, something like that, and join together. Then the next stage is on the plan view, how the building will look like. So they decided to come up with a two square, all right, two square, and to show that that is an eight pointed star. So that is the shape, the plan sheet initially decided. And subsequently, the architect are uh, worried this uh, eight pointer star shape uh, doesn't provide sufficient space. Okay, so that means it cannot meet the maximum area available for the building. So therefore, the architect put the uh, insert the extra circle or segment at all the intersecting point, the inner part of the corner. So all this corner, the architect add the additional uh, circle over here and uh, one big circle outside. So finally, the shape 
become something like that. And with this, the architect study the, the you know the detail, the floor area, and the client are happy with that. So therefore, finally, this is the shape of the buildings. All right, this is the shape of the building that was built uh, as built now. So that is the how the concept are developing. And uh, you know, so like uh, just now the ship, uh, the earlier, the earlier on, a green ship, uh, this, this was the a green ship. So it come to finally, uh, then they start to have a detailed design, how to make you uh, utilize of the internal part, etc. So uh, this is a schematic diagram. This were the schematic diagrams. So probably is reached a uh, LOD 300 to 350 already. So there are more detailed uh, information are included. Okay, so this is a uh, architecture rendering of the building. And these are the detailed construction already. So definitely over here is LOD 350 and above already. Is a more detail of the building, the design and the dimension are all fixed already. Finally, that is a construction carried out at the site, and this is the finished building we have. Uh, you used to see now. All right. Now, so that is the architectural process. Now, what about the statutory process? statutory process uh, there are many law involved now i only highlight uh, for this uh, slide i only bring out one two three four five six i only bring out six rules or six acts six different acts uh, acts in the constructions but actually there are more than that i'll show you later let's just look at this uh. NLA is a national land code. TCPA is town and country planning act. Then we have a strict drainage and building act. Also the uniform building bylaw. We have a housing development act and also strata title act. These are only uh, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, only six pieces of uh, selected uh, rule involved uh, of the construction and development process. In actual fact, probably we will near 100 different act or rules involved. So first of all, for the statutory process, uh, as an individual, when you want to carry out any construction, you need to submit your, you need to apply for the planning permission from the local authority, okay? And local authority, when they approve your drawing, they have to refer to the local plan. Local plan, that is the statutory plan, a uh, statutory approved development plan in a local area. Okay, they have to check with that. If it comply with that, then you can go ahead. They will grant you the planning permission and you can start to, uh, to carry out the work. But if your submissions, if involve any conversion of the land users. So for example, uh, let's say uh, the site for your assignment, if that is a commercial land, and now you want to build a resident building. So in other words, you need to get the conversions from the, com from the, from the land use, commercial land use to the residential la land use. So changes of the land use, this is the authority by the state government, not the local government. So it's at the state level. So you need to apply uh, to the state level uh, in the land office in the state level to approve the land conversions. Only after the conversion are done, then only you carry out. Okay, you can carry out your, your development. And another example for the involved with a national land code uh, or national land authority is, for example, your development project, 
Okay, that is a one big title. But after you completed, you are going to build, say, 200 units of the residential unit, and then you sell to individual buyer. And all the individual buyer, they buy your property, okay? They need to have a document, the title, to show that that is the, you know, they are the rightful owner or lawful owner of the property. So they need to have a land title, uh, the property title. So for this uh, title, because your land is this much, and then the building is over here. So the title is whole piece of the of the land. So how do you give to the owner? Okay, to show that they own a certain uh, part of the building. So therefore, you need to carry out with the subdivisions. So this you need to apply through the land office. Subdivision means uh, divided this piece of land to when many, many pieces. Okay. And then each owner of the property, probably let's say this is belong to you. This is a Chia Fa Choi one. So this is a one point one one. This is a VUNI one. Thing like that. So that is called a subdivision. So you need to carry out with the subdivisions. And uh, once the plan, planning permission are granted, then you can proceed to prepare the detailed drawing. So that is what we call the building plan approval. And uh, after that, you can proceed with the, once the building approved, you can proceed with your tendering procedures. And uh, once the building approved, you can start to seal your property. So uh, you can start to conduct the seals. And uh, when the tender carry out, after the tender carry out, you carry out the constructions, the sales will continue. So once uh, any property are sold, then you have to start to apply for the strata title. So this one, what I showed just now is a strata title. And uh, when the project complete, uh, when the, you, you, you get the CC, CCC completions of, uh, of the project, then you can start to process for the strata title, and then uh, the developer have to transfer the data uh, title to the lawful buyer. So that is the whole process involved in the in the development. Uh, this was the process involved in the development. Now, just now I told you that uh, the six pieces of the law I selected. Uh, is only selected six pieces of the law. Now, now here, uh, probably you can see, definitely you can see uh, the word are too small. So these are all the different law, and including this side also, all the different law involved in, uh, in uh, carry out construction and development of the project. Okay. So I try to make it bigger for you. So you can see there's a town and country planning act, which I mentioned. There's a national development planning, national land code, I mentioned also. Then there are other act like land conversion, etc. Building and common property act, strict design building act, I mentioned also. Uh, this one I haven't mentioned, environmental quality act, legislation of building act, housing development act, I have mentioned. And uh, then we have other building code, uh, and act, drainage act, contract act, etc. to follow. And these are the different agency involved. That is only on the development order. Uh, the first part only. The first, the second part, you when you process your building plan permit. So these are the authority are uh, involving. Okay, a uh, building plan. So when you come to the construction phase. So construction phase, again, you have a different law involved in the construction and also different body involved. And finally, when you reach the completion, for example, so there are also involvement of a different authority before the, the project are considered as uh, finally completed. So these are the different law 
and the authority involved in the statutory process. All right. Now the the last process uh, I want to highlight is the costing process. So costing process we base on the RI, uh, we base on RICS, okay, the process, uh, the costing process. So RICS uh, looking uh, try to work in parallel with RIBA, RIBA. Uh. So for example, during the preparation stage, there's an appraiser and design brief. So we need to prepare the order of cost estimate. And during the conceptual design or design development, so you need to prepare the cost plan. All right, so uh, cost plan one, two, three, you keep updating. Once uh, the production information, that means the detailed drawing are ready already, then you can start to have a pre-tender estimate, okay, based on the approximate quantity. And once the PQ are ready, you can call for the tender. So once the tender are closed already, then you need to make another new estimate. So that is a post tender estimate uh, for the client approval. So then uh, the work, the actual construction can be carried out at the site and to complete the constructions. Now with this, uh, I have uh, give you an outline of the whole development process. Do you have any questions so far? Any questions so far on the development process? Okay, so uh, now the time is 10.02. Uh, probably we'll take a break. I will resume at uh, how long you want it? Issue and 10 10. Is it okay? Less than 10 minutes. I'll resume at 10 10. Okay, uh, so uh, by 10 10, we will uh, looking into more detail of the, of the order of cost estimate and design process. All right. So that is uh, what I plan to do for the next stage. All right. So uh, we take a break now.
Okay, can you see me? Hear me? Yes, sir. Thank you, John. We will continue with the next sections. All right, now, now we will look at a more detail for the first stage. Uh, just now we have seen the word uh, business case. Okay. What does it mean by business case? Business case is uh, just now I, sh I have uh, roughly tell you, which means uh, whether your project are making money or not, etc. Now, uh, business case for the development project, like uh, you are carrying out some development for sales purpose or whatever purpose, then uh, to determine the business case, that is quite easy to determine. So because we base on what are the total sales you can generate and then what are your total expenses, or we call it development cost. The difference, if there's a sufficient uh, profit margin, then we can consider this project is viable, we can go ahead, etc. But for some of the project uh, like for example especially when we are talking about the development project by the government for example they want to build a hospital or they want to build a school or they want to carry out some uh, infrastructure 
like highway, etc. Now, how to determine the business case? You get what I mean or not? Like for example, let's say a public school. Public school, probably, you know, uh, the school are not collecting any fee. Okay, so uh, it's only rely on the development uh, budget given by the government. So therefore, how to how to that come up with the business case? You got my you got my question or not? Heng Wing Ho. Wing Ho. So today I recorded three names. Uh, no response. Din Jin Jie, Yang Yin Ni, Heng Wing Ho. Michelle. Michelle Wong. Wang Wan Jin, were you there? Ah uh, yes, sir. Hello. Uh, hello. What is uh, your name, please? Uh, Michelle. Ah uh, Michelle, ah uh, Michelle Wang Wan Jin. Now, ah, uh, do you get my question or not? Like, for, I repeat my questions, ah, uh, like the housing development. So, if you want to determine the business case. It's quite easy. We're looking at how much uh, unit you are developing and how much you are selling. Then the difference uh, minus the construction cost. If there's a profit, then we will say that is a positive uh, profit. So that is a business case. But let's say for the hospital, public hospital, government hospital, government school, how do you determine the business case? We we try to limit it to the school. Let's say a secondary school, so you don't collect the the tuition fee from the from the students. You rely on the government's uh, you know allocations. Then how to determine whether that is a worthy to carry out uh, such a project? How to determine the business case? That is my question. You got any idea or not? No. No, uh, never mind. OK, if you know, then uh, you won't come to join my class. But you listen carefully, uh, Michelle. Mm. OK, so you I'm going to explain that now. Uh, so for other other project, uh, it's not for the not for the commercial uh, purpose. So we call this as a cost benefit analysis. Cost benefit analysis. Have you come across with this term before? Cost benefit analysis. Missia, have you come across with this term before? Cost benefit analysis. Mm, I think no. Never. Okay. But uh, you all have to prepare because uh, who knows? One of these days, uh, you set out your own company, and then some uh, somebody will approach you and uh, give you a project. Okay, so probably that is a government project, and uh, which involved with the with uh, things something like that, and you are not based on the sales value to determine the the sales or this thing. So you have to come up with the cost benefit analysis. So this is a one type of a business case as well. Now for the cost, there's a no issue for you as a QS. So you can very easy to determine whether uh, you construct the bridges, the road or whatever. You can determine the cost very easily. But how to determine the benefit? OK, that is the part. Now, normally, let's say I, I use uh, infrastructure as an example. The infrastructure, normally what we have, like for example, highway. So once you completed the highway, uh, uh, let's say from a location A to a location B, 
if without the highway, you travel from location A to location B, probably it might take you five hours. Uh, once you completed with the highway already from location A to location B, it only take you one hour only. So, which means you will save a four hour. Okay, the saving is a four hour. Then the next thing uh, what you can do is you you can base on before you carry out the project. So you you look at the you know you carry out some study the field study. How many car or vehicle are moving? There or how many people they are moving from one place to another place every day? Okay, uh, 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 every day. Take for example, and uh, then uh, for each time of a traveling, they can save for four hour. Let's say you have a uh, ten, uh, one hundred thousand of a vehicle moving from one place to another place, so they are saving four hour. So. Four hour multiply with one hundred thousand. That is a four hundred hour saving. So four hundred hour saving, then you can convert it to the, uh, to the monetary value. For example, let's say uh, one hour, uh, on average one person can say uh can earn one hundred dollars. So four hour times one hundred thousand times one hundred dollars per hour. So that will give you uh one million. OK, so that means uh, every day, for example, the benefit you are going to save is uh, one million. OK, so for one year, you are going to save 365 million. So 365 million, uh, that is a uh, one year. If you construct the highway, it costs you 400 million. So which means you can work up with uh, in approximately one year's time, we can recover the cost. So the cost can be recovered due to the saving of the time using of the road. So then you can justify this project is a viable because it only within a year, uh, whatever expenses, it can be recovered back by the people using the road. All right. The government's role is to develop, to help people to facilitate the development. So in this case, it can be go ahead. So which means you have established the cases, the business cases to carry out the work. Can you understand Michelle now? Michelle? Yeah, yeah. You can understand now? Mm. So that is the meaning of the, you know, uh, when we are carrying out the infrastructures, uh, uh, we will be looking in the cost benefit analysis, for example. But of course, uh, this is the uh, only part of the calculation only. Another part is, let's say, uh, for the existing road. So normally, if you cause a uh, probably uh, accident, uh, that of a uh, one person uh, for every ten thousand. So every ten thousand, there's a uh, one one that uh, per year. So for 100,000 uh, people using the road, that means there is a 10% uh, are going to die using the road because of the accident, according to the record. Then, of course, the next question, probably some of you, uh, you know, will be think that that is unethical because you are going to estimate the life. What is the value of the life? Is there any value of a life? Okay, that is another question. Is there any value of life? I try to call another student. Wang Peiying. Wang Peiying. Peiying. Yeah, thank you for your response. Uh, is there the a value for life? How much is your life cost? How much is your life worth? Sure. Can we determine? Can we determine the life of a person based on your opinion? No. No. Ah, uh, 
we cannot say that you know uh, your life is 100,000 my life is a uh, 1 million all right but when you come to cost benefit analysis uh, you have to give the life a value okay so it sounds ethically not correct but we have to determine because uh, let's say to save the 10 person's life by carrying out this development in order to come up with cost benefit analysis we have to convert the 10 life into the value so now the next question is uh, how to determine the value of the life okay so therefore one way of doing this uh, is based on the insurance you know what i mean because uh, do you have any insurance policy your life insurance policy paying no no uh, but i think uh, very soon after you graduate uh, there'll be a lot of insurance men come to ask you to buy the insurance okay <laughs> now when you when you are getting an insurance uh, policy uh, so uh, how you get the insurance policy I mean, uh, that is based on a uh, touch work. Unfortunately, you go away already. OK, so the beneficiary, probably your parent. OK, your parent will get a compensation. So based on how much, you know, you you cover in the policy. So probably uh, you put it as a uh, 500,000. So that means uh, if uh, something happened to you, the beneficiary will get 500,000. So which means your life value is 500,000. So that is uh, how to determine cost benefit analysis, uh, the life of, uh, you know, the, the, the value of the life. So let's say we come back to the example. Just now we say uh, we can save a 10 death of a root accident. So these are 10, 10 persons, uh, we look at normally the, the policy in terms of insurance policy, normally this kind of people. So for this area, how much the insurance they will cover? So say one million per life. So for ten percent, that means ten millions. So that is the value will be added into the benefit to determine. So if the cost minus the benefit, the benefit are bigger than the the cost, then that means you can you have established the business case. Can you understand? Uh, yes. OK, I thank you very much. OK, let me continue with this example now. Huh? Now, uh, come back to our development. So cross development, uh, let's say you estimate for this uh, property, you can carry out 200 units of apartment and each one it can be sold at 500,000. So, which means your total sales will be 100,000. And then uh, for development cost, a very rough estimate, land cost is a 10 million. And then the construction cost for one unit of apartment, uh, probably 300,000 based on your historical data. You are going to develop 200 units, multiply with 300,000, so you get 60 million. Then the professional fee, assuming is 10% of the 60,000. Then uh, finance cost, that is also a major component, 7% uh, per annum. So uh, total, uh, because the total here is uh, 76 million for your finance cost times 7% uh, per annum. So that is a uh, 5 million. When you add together, your total development cost is 81 million. 81 million, 100,000 divided by 81 million, that is 18.6. Uh, you, you will have a profit of 18.68. So here, 18, 18 million, 18 divided by the cost is 81 million. So uh, you will get a figure, let's say you get a figure more than 20% for development project. Huh? Normally, we need to get at least a 20% then any world to develop. So if you get a, a figure more than 20% 20, 20 your surplus divided by your cost, then which means the project have established the business case and it can be go ahead. So this is a, what it mean by business case. Any questions? 
Any questions? Is it clear, Charles? Uh, sir, may, may I ask one thing about just now you said the cost benefit analysis. Is it something similar mm. to the profit analysis from property development? Yes, it's a similar. It's a similar, but for the normally property developments, uh, you have a sales, ma. Uh, you yeah, have yeah, a yeah. cost, ma. Correct or not? But then in yeah, uh, yeah, some yeah. of the social project like the school building, hospital, infrastructure, all these constructions, uh, there's a no sales value. So therefore, how do you determine the sales value? So therefore, the cost benefit analysis, the benefit component is the is the uh, is your sales component. So we have to estimate the benefit. Oh, okay, okay. Is it clear or not? It's a similar. It's a similar. I agree with you. Okay. As I okay, say, yeah, the so. normal commercial development, you have a sales. But then for the infrastructure or social project, there's no sales. So you have to, instead of the sales, you have to look into the benefit. The cost component is the same. Charles, is mm -hmm. my explanation clear? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, sir. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. So now we go to more detail. Uh, for the business case, we have to determine the gross development value. Now, how to determine the gross development value? First of all, we have to know the unit of development. That means how many units you can develop. Then the second thing is you have to determine what is the selling price. So what are the sales price you can establish for each unit of the development? Now for the first part, right, unit of development, unit of development, the first part. Then for this part, we have to look into the statutory process already. So for this part, all the rules and regulation we need to comply, okay? So that is the first thing we have to refer to the statutory requirement. Huh? Statutory requirement. Statutory requirement, basically there are two block category. The first part is a land use zoning. The second part is development intensity. Now land use as a zoning, uh, for example, in Kuala Lumpur, so this is a Kuala Lumpur. Uh, the use of air, all the pieces of the land, all right, is determined, is a predetermined already. So what it can be used. So the land use joining in Kuala Lumpur, we have a commercial, uh, the primary use, we have a commercial, mixed use, residential, in, industrial and special industry, institution, open space, special use. All right, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. There are, there are seven primary uses. And each of the primary uses, uh, and all the primary uses are further divided to the land use zone. For example, commercial are divided into the city center commercial, district center commercial, neighborhood center commercial, and commercial. And for mixed use, we have a mixed use commercial, mixed use residential, mixed use commercial, and industry. All right. So uh, now you look at this uh, color on both uh, map. Uh, you can see all the different color. Color or not, it's a very colorful. Now all those are color actually are represent the different land uses. Okay, so for different like city center commercial tapru. So the tapru that means that piece of land you can use for the city center uh, commercial purpose only, and not for residential purpose. So take for example, all the color. You can look here, like here, uh, the pink color is a public institutional. So like this piece of land and this piece of land, that's for the public institutional. So all this land, their land use purpose are predetermined, okay, uh, by the authority. So when you want to carry out any development on a piece of land, the first of all, you have to check with the authority. What is your land use zoning? 
OK, now in this case uh, for your assignment purpose. Uh, on the piece of land, the car park we have. Uh, so your guy not no need to go to the land office or whatever or Gajiang or Majis Gajiang to search for the purpose of the land. We because that is only a hypothetical project. So therefore we will uh, fix it as a mixed use residential. OK, mixed use, uh, mixed use residential. So everybody will assume that piece of land is for the mi mixed use uh, residential to 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 carry up uh, of your assignment. Is it clear? Mixed use residential. There's a land use zoning for the piece of land. Now, first thing you have to, I repeat, uh, going back. So you have to determine the land use zoning of the piece of land. Then the second part is development intensity. Land use zoning, I explained already. Development intensity, there are few things we have to look into. Density control or block ratio control. Why I put a stroke here, density control or block ratio control? That is depends. Huh? Uh, if you are using density control, then you don't need to look at the block ratio control. If you are looking at the block ratio control, then you don't need to consider density control. For example, huh? in this case, it depends on the land users. Let's say if the land use is for residential purpose, only for residential purpose, then you have to consider the density control. If for the residential, but for the mixed use, just now I say mixed use uh, for your piece of land, mixed use residential, then the considerations will be based on the block ratio control. OK, I will explain the block ratio control subsequently. Then another things uh, under development intensity you need to con consider is the print area. OK, and uh, now I will explain in detail what is all this. Uh. Density control as what I say. Uh, if it's only purely for lens residential purpose, then which means that uh, you are using the density control, which are determined by one acre of land. OK, let's say if you fall in the land use zone R1, you can build one to 10 units per acre. Or if you fall into R3 category, the land use zoning, which means you can build 40 to 100 units per acre. If you fall into the public housing, then probably you can build 100 units per acre. So that is called the density control. And each unit of the houses you build, uh, it can be stay by four person. So therefore, you can see this table actually is multiple of four of this uh, of the right hand side uh, column. Any questions? Any question on density control? Any question? Come on. OK. Now, then the next consideration uh, is a block ratio. Please hear this. Uh, please listen to this point clearly. Uh. If you are, late, you are using density control, you don't need to consider block ratio. If you are using block ratio control, you don't need to consider density control. OK, this is a key word. And uh, whether you are using density control or whether you are using the block ratio control, it depends on the land use zoning. OK, let's say if your land use for residential, then you have to use a density control. For others, generally we are based on the block ratio control. Is it clear? OK, now now uh, for the block ratio control, what does it mean? So like for example, for the different uh, different users uh, over here, 
difference uh, land use zoning, you have a difference of uh, block ratios. OK, permissible block ratio. Let's say just now we say that our is a uh, mixed use residential. So which means your block ratio can be one to four up to one point one to eight. But for your assignments uh, for your project, we fix it to one to four. OK. That is the requirement, uh, assuming that we fix it at one to four. OK, now then one, one to four, one to eight, what does it mean? Now, if you look at this diagram, uh, so uh, this diagram, so which means there are three, there are three levels, isn't it? One, two, three. OK. Assuming that this is a floor plan, uh, this is a floor, uh, not the roof. OK. Oh, OK, la. I make it as a roof, uh, easy for you. So which means uh, for this plan, that is a uh, two floor. Correct or not? Two floor occupied on a piece of land. So in this case, uh, the block ratio is one to two. Can you get it? Are you OK? There are some problem I cannot call your name. Can someone uh, respond? Petinje, were you there? Petinje? Yes, sir. So, can you understand the block ratio one to two? Yes, understand. Okay, huh? now then can you tell me? This one, what is the block ratio? Uh, How many? One, two, three, four. This is a four story building. What is the, what is the block ratio? One, two, four. Are you sure? This is one, the land area, you know. The land area is here. So it occupies half of the land only. Okay, uh, one to eight. Huh? Uh, sorry. Um. One to two. Okay. You got it or not? It's oh, also one. Means, um, the two story is for the one, one of the land area. So four yeah. story is for two. Okay. Understand? You understand? Mm. Huh? So similarly, uh, I hope you all can uh, go through and try to understand this, this diagram. That is uh, the block ratio, what it means. Jinjie, are you okay? Yes, okay. Thank you, sir. Uh, try, try to go through the last R. Uh. Mm. Now then what yeah. is a print area? Print area, for example, for this building, sir, for this building, a circle one, the print area, you look at the ground floor, the one floor, it occupied half of the land. So therefore, the print ratio is 50%. You understand what I mean or not? Can, can I get a Chai Chong Han? Are you around? Chai Chong Han? Chai Chong Han. No response also. Chai Chong Han. Chia Chen Jie. Chia Chen Jie. Chia Chen Jie. Oh, you have Hello. Hello, sir. Yeah. Good. Chia Chen Jie, you are the first one to log in, uh, Korea, no? this morning. Ah, uh, yes. And, uh, yeah. Because I uh, think it's at the class. Yeah. Oh, you think it's yeah. the class? Yeah, I think of this. It. See, I thought you are very, very interesting with my class. <laughs> yeah, I also very interesting in your class also. <laughs> okay. Now, Chen Jie, okay. 
Now, can you look at the, the second diagram? Uh, I square okay. one. Uh. Can you okay. tell me what is the print area? How many percent? Uh, 50. 50 or so. Correct or not? Yeah. Uh, how about this one? This one. Uh, this one uh. I think is uh, 20 percent. Uh. Oh, 20, uh, 25, 25 percent. Very good, very good, very good. Uh, last one. This one. Uh, this what one is the print area? 75. Very good. So you understand the concept very clear uh, for the print yes. area. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank yeah. you. Uh, Cynthia. <laughs> All right. So uh, your guy understand uh, the the meaning of the print areas. All right. Now, in this case, uh, for the block ratio control, for example, let's say the, the area, uh, the piece of land, the area here for this block of land is a 10,000 square meter. The block ratio is 3.5. So, which means that uh, you can total build up 5,000 square meter. So that means even though the land is only 10,000, but because the block ratio is 3.5, so you can build 35,000. Like the land just now I say, uh, uh, your assignment, the block ratio is one, one to four. Let's say the land area is 10,000, that means you can build up to 40,000 square meter. So that is a block ratio. Uh, the floor area is for the whole floor, uh, we have to consider another consider consideration is uh, for the commercial area. So over here, I assume that 30 percent are for the of the floor area are for commercial area. Commercial areas are, are, are area, for example, your lift, your staircase, your corridor, or those uh, area used for the services. OK, like LLN substation, all those things. So this area, you cannot sell this area. You cannot say that, oh, you want to pass the cost, uh, the corridor, then I collect the tolls from you. No such thing. OK, so therefore you have to allow those area which you cannot, cannot seal one. You have to minus this area. So here, this is up to you based on your experience to assume how many percent of the floor area for common area. So 35,000 minus 30,000, uh, 30% 30 of the floor area, we have a net 24,500. And assuming that now one unit of accommodation you can build is a 120 square meter. So you have 24,500, 24,500 divided by 120, so you let, uh, that means total you can build 204. So that is how you come about with a quick estimate of uh, how many unit you can build. For your project budget, you remember? So now if I go through those uh, detailed calculation, this 200 will become 204. OK, so of course all this figure will change. All right, and all the figure will change accordingly. Can you understand this part or not? Okay, uh, let me call some other names. Lee Manchun, were you there? Lee Manchun? Yes, sir. Can you understand or not so far? Yes, I can understand. Okay. So uh, you can prepare a rough, rough cost estimate. Can you? Yes, I think so. Okay. Thanks. Now, just now when I'm talking about common areas, uh, so uh, for example, this place, okay, is a public place. And for this area also, 
public area. So probably you cannot seal this area. So that is the reason when you when you estimate your total number of units, uh, that means uh, how many this unit you can build on a piece of land. So you have to minus off all these uh, areas. Is it clear? So uh, for example, for this cross development, uh, let's say finally we, we find out we can build 204 unit and uh, then we have to determine the sales. OK, the sales price of uh, each of this unit. So how to determine the sales of this unit? So you can go for the website, uh, the property website, like for, for example, Property Guru. Then you can type the location. Let's say your development is in Sungai Long. You search for Banda Sungai Long and then for the apartment or for the condominium. So this is what I get from the Property Guru. So it shows that, you know, at the moment they are selling 425,000. And I fix it at 450,000 because consider of my project are going to uh, start launching probably in one year's time. So they might have a price increase and also consider that, you know, I'm, I'm confident that I'm going to, uh, my building are newer. So I have, uh, I will incorporate more facilities, more up to date facility. So I think I can fetch the value higher at 450,000. So 204 multiply 450,000 per unit. So then for this project, my GDP are 91,800 million. All right. Now with this, uh, I think I will stop here uh, to I will stop here for for today, but before we call it a day, uh, can you try the this quiz to check your understanding? I paste here for the link. Yeah, can you click on the link and try to Work up and see whether you understand my lecture or not. Is the link working, Charles? Is the link working, Charles? Ah, uh, yes, the link is working, sir. Okay, thank you, Charles.
Okay, class. Uh, there are 70 have a respond. Uh, we are almost uh, reached the time. One minute left. So just uh, let me quickly uh, go through the answers. All right. Uh, Now, first of the, for the first question, sir, assuming the local authority has informed you that the rubber block ratio of your development is not as it is not exceeding 3 by 4. So which means the block ratio is 1 to 3 by 4. The print ratio is a 60 percent. What is the permissible built up area of your land? 40,000 square meter. So in other words, your Total floor area of your development cannot be more than 40,000 times 3.4. So that is 136,000 square meter. OK, so uh, most of you are getting correct. 71 percent. Uh, getting it right. Now then for the same project in Q1, what is the maximum footprint area? Footprint area that is depends on the print area, uh, print area percentage. So the question has said that the print area is uh, 60%. So 60% times 40,000, so therefore 24,000. That is your footprint area. Now then the next question, uh, for the same question one, what is the flowing closest to the typical floor area? Now, the typical floor area normally are very close with the footprint area. It won't be exact. It cannot be exact, but it will be very close. All right. Uh, okay, not draw here. Let me show you later. So the, the footprint areas actually are uh, and the typical floor area. It will be very similar, but it won't be exactly the same. The reason is, uh, let me show you. Let's say this is your, your building. OK, this is your building. So uh, the fourth pin. OK, the block ratio. So the footprint is this part, the footprint area and the typical floor, it will be very similar. But, but uh, let's say if you have a balcony, you have a balcony over here, your cloud floor, you, you don't have a balcony. But when you calculate the print area, you need to dig into the consideration of this part. All right, so therefore, the print, the, the footprint area and the, and the uh, typical floor area, it might not be exactly the same. OK, so this is the footprint. OK, the footprint means the area contact with the ground. Can you understand this? Then uh, the next question, sir. Uh, for the same project in Q1, which is the most uh, likely number of floor? So you know that the total floor area you can build is 136,000. Am I right? Based on the block ratio, 136,000. 136,000 is the total floor area, and each floor typically is 24,000. So 136,000 divided by 24,000. I think you got the value six point something. Am I right? So, uh, which means uh, generally what you have is one, one. Oh, I cannot write. Don't know why. Mm. 136,000 divided by 24,000. So you have a six point something number of floor. 
So therefore, we assume you can build six floor. Okay, because uh, the number of floor is more or less uh, is a whole number. It's an integer. You cannot say that I built six point five floor. All right. So uh, seldom we have a such situation. It's not something impossible, but normally we don't have a such thing. So therefore, we round it up. The answer is a six floor. So with this, we have uh, finished uh, this topic. Is there any questions? Uh, no, sir. OK, I hope you enjoy the class. So uh, thank you. And uh, see you next week.